Welcome to podcast it's February. This is the first, 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 first edition of February, right? Kellyon, is this is this like the second? What are you doing, DJ? Okay. Twelve. Okay, already we've already done one. So this is like the second edition, and yeah, glad to be here for so many reasons because of the person that I want to talk to, and also um, topics that I want to have a conversation around. So let, let, let me read something. Let me read something about my guest today. Um, my guest today is Michael Siskripcha Chipanya, who was born on the 5th of June, 1994 in Blantyre, Malawi. And he's got a great passion for music, which developed when he was young. Actually, it started with poetry. Uh, inspired by the 90s hip-hop legend Tupac Sheku, Michael became a hip-hop fanatic and absorbed himself in the genre by exploring his history. And for Michael, it became more of a lifestyle than more than mere lyrics. All right? Michael recorded his first song at age 12 with a local hip-hop group in Blantyre, then known as Korag Ami. And for three years, he was part of this, th- this group, part of this group, which included these groups, which included artists like Genetic X, X1, DQ, Diamond Quality, KNJ, and Inkosi. In 2009, Michael decided to leave the group after committing himself to Jesus Christ and was that same year taken on to F611 Ministries. Let's stop there. You have been hip-hop through and through. <laughs> yeah, man. All right? Yeah. Okay. Now, talking about hip-hop... And that's where we'll start our conversation from. Um, in South Africa, we just got the news that AK has been shot. And how did you receive that? What were you doing when you read about uh, AK being shot and being uh, pronounced dead? What was your reaction and how did the story uh, get to you? Well, it was unbelievable. Like, I was coming from work and I first saw a video that went out and it was like, AK has been shot dead. And I was like, nah, it can't be true because it wasn't even a verified account. So I, was, I, I didn't really take much of what I saw. And then I'm home trying to get a meal done and everything. And I'm still scrolling on Twitter and everything. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's getting serious. It seems like until I think I saw a post by Julius Malema. He posted something like what's happening to our artists or something like that. Then I was like, okay, I think there's something. I think it's it's really happening. But it's crazy, man. So I didn't follow him that much, but he was still iconic and you can't take away from what he's done for the culture and the industry, just the continent wide. Yeah. Now. Okay. Now, when you when you hear stories like this, and as somebody who has followed hip hop, not just as a musical genre, but as a culture, yeah. What 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 comes into your mind when you look at incidents like this? Um, there have been, I think, several shootings. I I was actually reading somewhere. Where they said, I think, uh, in the hip hop uh, industry, seventy percent of artists' death are murder. As somebody who's passionate about hip hop, what's going on in your head when you see things like this? I think it's unfortunate because <clears throat> I think you know hip hop has been around for about fifty years now, mm. so this is a time when we should be evolving growing yeah. and my perspective of hip hop other than just having fun is it's a craft that is there to elevate the mind you know so when you look at a hip hopper in terms of culture it's a person that is going to be well read a person that is going to research on things and you're going to put your mind to learning you know so as you learn, you expect people to evolve. And for the culture being around 50 years, mm-hmm. you'd expect p- 
people need to stop killing each other. You know, right. it's just unfortunate that people keep doing it. So okay. it feels like, to some extent, part of the culture is going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah, because when you look at it from way back, you were inspired by Tupac, according to what I just read here. Yeah. And this is one guy that we grew up knowing that is on the hat too. <laughs> ah, oh, that. I was actually looking at that. I was like, ah, who is that? Ah, I see that. Ah, yeah. yeah. So you're being inspired by um, an artist like Tupac. And growing up, we know he was gunned down. Talk yeah. about Notorious B.I.G. was gunned down. What do you think? Is it like part of part of it? Is it like supposed to be like that? Or what could could have gone wrong with the culture? Uh, it shouldn't be like that. I think, you know, hip hop has been for a long time associated with pride, violence, and so many things. But mainly because hip hop is also, in essence, more of a rebel music. It is about speaking truth. So no matter how ugly the truth is, you have to speak it. No matter you, it's not about sugarcoating things. It's about being honest as honest you, as you can be. So that kind of expression, it made sense, but I don't think it was the direction that we should have been going, and I don't even think it was necessary or it was worth it. I mean, Tupac died at what twenty five. You don't want to lose people so young, so young yeah, absolutely. you know? So I'm even way older than he was when he died. So I don't think that's the way to go. Okay. All right. So for all of you that are watching this podcast, as usual, this podcast is brought to you by Crypto University. Go to CryptoUniversity.network to sign up and to be part of... Um, the generation that's making money investing in cryptos, NFTs, and all those coins that are um, helping people to find their financial freedom. And I'm with Michael, Syscripture Japan. Tell me about your upbringing. Where did you grow up? And um, when was this that you started like uh, falling for poetry that led you to hip hop and all that? Uh, your family background, anything? Well, um, I was born in Blanta. Okay. I grew up in Blanta for You're a Blanta person. Yeah, I grew up in Blanta, Chigumula. I think I was there for about fifteen years or so. Okay. Yeah. So growing up, it was quite a diverse neighborhood. Um uh, so you were kind of exposed to different kinds of worlds. And it was just interesting for me. School, I was at Antonia. Uh -huh. And it was one of the good schools at the yeah, time. Yeah, I, I think Antonia used to be like one of the yeah, schools. Like, I, uh, I think back then it was Antonia and Lady Bird. Yeah, I think that was it. Yeah. And they were rival schools. <laughs> and it was, it was very interesting. But yeah, I remember I had... Uh, a teacher, I think she was Miss Mbender. She was a very good teacher. She got me interested in poetry because she would kind of, she would teach you using rhyming words. So that kind of stuck. Yeah. That's how words would just stick in my head. So I, I got interested. I'd just scribble things down and... Both I have two uncles, my dad's brothers. They uh, they were like hip hop heads, mm -hmm. you know. So the listening to all of this hip hop, and I was interested, you know. So when they moved to America, they left me everything, all the tapes. That time it was tapes. Yeah. I was even before CDs. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so it was tapes, and back at the house. You had to wait until everybody else goes to bed because that's the time you can actually sit at the radio. Yeah. And you had a time limit because at 9.30 you have to you go, to, go bed, to bed, <laughs> you know? So you would wait because 
you know how it was back then, you know, everybody is in one space, so you can't be there listening to music. The parents want to watch the news. Yeah. Or they want to listen to the listen news to or the, the radio. radio. Yeah. So you had to wait your time out. And once they go to bed, that's when you're playing something and you're listening. And I remember, I think that was also around the time they had, um, I think that was what, Basement and Drill. Those radio shows, I think. On, on 101. 101 back uh, then. Th- there was Hip Hop Drill. And then there was um, another one. It was sponsored by Sprite. I think it was like a yeah. hip hop show. So yeah. those were the times where I was more exposed to hip hop. And because of the tapes that I was left, it was just Tupac, Wu-Tang, yeah. and the Wu-Tang members. Yeah. So that was what I was really exposed to, Nas. And... As much as Tupac influenced me a lot, my favorite MC is still Nas. Ah. <laughs> so you see a lot of influence from Nas and just how I create and my approach to music. I see. So um, you are in Tonya and you've studied uh, poetry. How did the music come in? When did it? you actually study like, oh, whether it's like singing, whether it's like... Oh, I was, I was always interested in music. Um, my family was musical. Okay. Um, funny enough, my dad told me a story about a time where he made himself a guitar and then his dad broke it because <laughs> his dad was like, you got to be focusing on school, on school no. <laughs> not music. Not music yeah. So I think some of those, just, those genes just came to me because... Growing up, I was always interested in music. Mm -hmm. So there was always this back and forth with the parents where I think he never wanted to kill that because of what had happened to him. So he let me run with it, but he was always keeping that eye. Like, don't don't get too caught up with the music so much that you don't do your school. So it was back and forth. And I remember when I was younger, my sister used to sing in a choir. So I tried, and this is the reason why I think most of my music is not musical in the sense of me singing and stuff, because when I went, they said, nah, bro, you can't sing. (laughs) That hurt. Yeah. (laughs) It hurt. Yeah. But I think it took me a while to try and sing and explore that, but it just hurt me inside so much that for a long time, even if we go to church and the singing choruses and all of this thing, I just sit there sing like, words. I can't sing, you know? But that's what it was. So I never joined the choir, but I was always there because I had to get back home with my sister. Uh, so, I wait on so I had to wait, you know? So every time they're singing and they're the, playing all the instruments, I'm just sitting there, I'm just watching. And that's when I tried at one point because there were these youth events said, oh, okay, maybe I'm a rap. So I went in front of the church and I rapped. And the whole church was quiet. Everybody just looked at me. Nobody even clapped. They just looked at me. Because back then, hip-hop wasn't a thing in church. No, like, <laughs> how would you go in church and rap? Because hip-hop did not belong there. Hip-hop had its own... Yeah, it, it, it had a different route. But I, I wanted to be in church and I wanted to rap. And that was a place and that was like a youth gathering. So people then at church knew, oh, he can rap, but why is he trying to bring that to church? (laughs) You know, so it was just weird. So that also kind of pushed me away for a bit where I really did like just step out and not make music for church. And then... For a minute, I went back, and then for a minute, I left it because of my convictions, because I realized that my approach to music was I was now creating for people, and I wasn't being honest. Because if I'm creating for people, hip-hop, like I said, is about honesty. Mm -hmm. So it's about being human, and the truth about being human is we just a sum of contradictions. So 
I stepped out to say, okay, I'm not putting myself as a person who raps about one thing. I'm going to be human and I'm going to rap about how I feel. I'm going to rap about what I see, what I'm going through and everything that surrounds me so I can share my story because that's my way of sharing my story. Because if I'm rapping about one topic, mm. how is that me sharing my story? Yeah. So I decided to be completely honest. And unfortunately, being honest is not always beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you started out as uh, part of this group, the yeah. Korag Army. Yeah. Which basically was just hip hop. Yeah, it, it was just, it was just like pretty much kids from different neighborhoods just getting together. Uh, Mangira then had a PC and a microphone, which we had like wires and everything just to, I think we used to use some stockings. I think there was mom's stockings. I don't know, man. Like <laughs> that was like our, like, you know, our condenser or something like that. Okay. It was crazy, man. But I remember... Well, I can say it now because, I, I mean, I left school. We used to skip school, bro. Like, <laughs> we skip school, spend the whole day recording, mm. you know? But I think that's what kept the passion alive. So some of these guys, because they had met up at school. So they were all in one school. Mm. I was the one in a different school with KNJ. KNJ, his name was also Mike, and he was my best friend as well. He's still my best friend, but I don't know where he's at right now. But... We used to skip school every time they were on holiday. So we'd go to his studio just to record. And the funny thing is, even when Daredevil set up their studio, uh, which is here, yeah. we used to skip school just to sit there and watch people record. Okay. Because we never had the money to pay. So we just, just stick around, man. We just stick around. We're not recording, man. I just want to watch. You know, like, that's how I became friends with them. Because... Yeah. I was the kid that just stuck around. So when people are not there is when I try and rap something. So I remember back then, uh, g Dude just throw me a beat. Like he gave me a beat and he told me, you know what? Go write a song and come back when you're ready. And trust me, back then when they tell you come back when you're ready, you got to have it in your head. So I went, I wrote it. And funny enough, we never recorded yet. So every time I went to the studio, it was like another person, another person, another person. And then it got to a point where I had to switch schools. So now I wasn't even close by. Mm -hmm. And we never recorded the song. But the good thing is, kept the relationship. We're still very good friends with Marcus and GD. So so you, you mean you stayed in the studio like when you were young, you grew up there and you left, but you never recorded with the guys? Yeah, with them. We never recorded with them. And to now? Or you recorded it like later on? Uh, funny enough, um, later on, what was happening is that I have my own setup. So I'd record and I'd send them. I'd oh. be like, oh, okay, GD, I want you on this song. So I'd send them. And it would be like, okay, he'll send me back something. Like right now, I'm also working on a project. And he's a very big part of it. Both of them, Marcus yeah, and GD. Good. Yeah. So what happens is the other in Blanta, but I record my stuff here. I send them. And whenever I'm in Blanta, I stop by the studio and I'm like, okay, I brought some of the other files. <laughs> so that's that's what our relationship has been like. I've been in studio with them like a number of times, but it's always we never record. Every time I've been at a studio with GD, Dimango yeah. Jesus. Like the whole time, the whole time. But that's way better than, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because I think you're building the relationship. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So let's let's get to your music journey now. Yeah. Uh, when you started doing your music, you, you're recording with these guys. What was it like? And uh, when you like changed schools, what followed then? What followed was... So it wasn't just as clear cut, like you said. Mm -hmm. So I left Koragami and then I was with F6. It wasn't just that clear cut because for a minute I was trying to figure myself out. So I was trying to figure out my journey mm -hmm. 
And I had given my life to Christ, put everything aside and saying, okay, I want to be on this journey. So, you know, when you do that, you are so zealous. Mm -hmm. You're excited and everything. Uh, I remember I was being discipled by Let Lusayo. So that was my mentor. So I recorded some stuff. He knew I could rap, mm -hmm. but we our relationship was never about rap. So he was mentoring me, but he realized, oh, okay, so this kid is really serious about this rap thing. Because every time I was at Chichiri at that time, every time at lunchtime, Liu and um, KBG, no, KBG wouldn't come, but it was Liu and um, Zach. Zach and some other guys, they'll come through every lunchtime, would have a campaigner's session where we'll just just chill, do a Bible study, quick Bible study, and just talk about life in general and everything. So mostly, because you would really, because this is teenagers, man. Yeah. You really need to get them hype. So Leo would always bust a couple of the bars and everything. And sometimes it would end up into a, like, you know, some small cipher, <laughs> you know, so because Jeremiah Jukwaz was also yeah, at, yeah, yeah. was also at Chichiri at the time. So sometimes we'd just be there and just bust a couple of bars. So Jerry, me, um, Liu, there was Bright, uh, there was DMD. I don't know if he still uses that. Rodney Kananji. I don't know if he still oh, uses DMD. Rodney Kananji. Yeah, I don't know if he uses DMD. Is he, but, is he doing music anymore? I think he still does because I heard a song a couple of, I think last year. Oh. I think it was last year, if not last year. Lord from him as well. Still one of the sickest MCs, man. Yeah. So every time we'd be there, we'd just bust a couple of bars and everything. And I made a song. Um, I made two songs, actually. Dreams and Exodus. How these songs flew, I don't know. Because back then, we weren't privileged to have the internet that much. Yeah. I remember even my phone was like a ZD and I recorded the song a DJ Mars, Aquila. And after I recorded it, it was just, I think I gave two or three guys, you know, like afterwards, all of these people are like, oh, I heard your song, man, you can spit. And I, I heard it was also on radio. I, I had no idea like how, it how it got there. Like, I just, I just hear stuff like, oh, dude, you can rap. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Where, where do you hear it? <laughs> do you know? And everybody was, so it was just, it was pretty much Wu-Tang style. No hook. I was just rapping like from first bar to the last bar. I was just rapping. So that got interesting to Losayo. And this one weekend he called me and he was like, I'm chilling with gospel. You should come through. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I got on the bus, went there, and Lawi was there. Gospel was there. Leo was there. And this was at Lusayo's house, man. So at Lusayo's house, it was food and good music. It was just food and good music. I loved that. Mm. So we're there, and... Now he's walking to the kitchen, you know, like he was eating something and he plays a beat. And Gio's like, oh, we jumping on that. And I was like, okay. So everybody lays the verse and I was last, you know, that's the song that became Light of Fire. Ah, I see. That is how the whole F6 thing came about. Because after that, Lucio called me up and he said, are you interested in being a part of this? Yeah. And I told him my condition was one thing, that it shouldn't be about the music, but they should actually disciple me to go in the right direction with life because life was just crazy, mm -hmm. you know? So he was like, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. So that's, that's how I actually ended up being with Gio, Sayo and Dua on F611. 
where were you at that time, uh, school wise? I was still in secondary school Persist- then. Oh, so okay. yeah, we. I think there were a couple of shows that we went to, but every time Sai had to come pick me up at the house because <laughs> oh. I couldn't <laughs> leave the house, so he had to come pick me up at the house and be like, tell my dad, "Oh, I'm gonna come drop him." Yeah. <laughs> So we go to places. I think we went to Chanko one time. Um, I think, yeah, because that's, that's the trip. I actually knew um, Chifundo, I think it's Lingao, because we were in his car. Wow. And he had a system, man. I could feel the beat on my chair that wow. time. I was booming, man. So I remember we did a show there. And yeah, Delegate was also there that show um we rapped together on stage and back then you didn't have to worry about fashion and everything man i just had a big hoodie like this fat form hoodie (laughs) i had jeans on with this oversized shoe but that was that was it because it was what it was so we did that um things happened and I think just before Sayu's death was when we were, we started having those now deep discipleship conversations about being honest with life and everything. And we were studying Francis Schaeffer, mm-hmm. true spirituality. So it it poses some serious questions. And some of the questions is if, what if, let's say, for instance, you live your whole life dedicated to God and you live selflessly and every, everything, you do everything that would constitute being good. Mm. And then you die, you meet God, and he says, for my glory, you need to go to hell. <laughs> would you? still love him Mm. would you still love god and Mm. would you still obey and say it's it's not about what i did it's It's about your glory yeah you know now going through that kind of discipleship and starting to go through those questions i started being very honest with myself being honest about my emotions my feelings so for a minute before he died, I actually wasn't doing music. People didn't know. I just stepped back. Mm. So I was going through that journey. I think the only song I had recorded then was Better Days, which is, I think, my best performing song till dead. Because mm-hmm. even when it went on Spotify, it got like yeah, 40,000 streams. I'm like, I was listening. <laughs> 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 yeah, but... It will, It came from that place where you have to now be honest with yourself to say, am I in this journey for the people? Yeah. Am I in this journey for myself? myself? Am I in this journey for God? You know, then I realized that it was a very personal journey. That's when I started getting personal with God. And I started realizing that it's not about the act you put out to be a good person but it's actually doing the work and then having God do that change in you and you become a good person so it's not that you're trying to be a good person but God brings about that conviction in you so when he does it's not like you're faking it yeah. it's who you are but you're also being honest with your feelings your emotions and sometimes people tend to get in your space and you feel like cussing them out. I kind of just let it fly. <laughs> you know? I used, I used to uh, a, a, a gospel rapper. I don't know. I'm going to come there. I'm going to come there. So, <laughs> that's funny. Should I answer <laughs> that? Should I leave no, it? No, don't answer that. Don't answer okay, that I should I, answer I, that. I, I, there's a way that I want to get there. Okay. I, I love what you're explaining and I've got several questions that I'll need to 
ask on as follow ups to this this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much, yeah, that was my journey. And I think that's what also started transitioning my music. Because even with late Lucio, this was the conversation we had to say, he, was, he said to me, he gave me an example of Braille. Braille is another one of my favorite MCs who's also had a very big influence on me. He said to me, have you noticed that Braille is not trying to be a Christian rapper in the sense of what we understood a Christian rapper Rap to, to be? be. Yeah. And at the same time, he wasn't trying to conform to the world. He was just being honest, you know? So you'd find Braille working with S1 mm. and all of these dope producers and all of them that at that time, we were always like, nah, man, I can't work with that guy. I'm going to work with that guy because he's a Christian. I can't spit with that guy because he doesn't rap Christ and all of these things. So. I think he was challenging my perspective and he really did because when I started asking myself that question to say, yeah, this guy is just being who he is. Mm. Who am I? Mm. Now to answer the question, who am I? It's not always pretty because sometimes you get to learn the ugly side of yourself yeah. and then you're like, okay, okay. I can't be like that. <laughs> but when you say I can't be like that, it's not something that you just hide and tuck away in your heart. It's something that you actually put in the work and you try to be a different person. So for me, like people say, oh, you cuss a lot and everything. Well, because I always used to cuss in my head. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cuss at you. But in my head, I would have cussed it like 50 times. Mm -hmm. Like the whole time I'd be there, I'd be cussing, you know? But it had to come out to get to a point where I had to get to know that, okay, you can't be like this, mm -hmm. you know? So I let it out, even in the music. I let it out how it was, mm -hmm. how I felt, I let it out. And by letting it out, that ugly side, is when the beauty starts coming out. That's when you get to start learning because then you start challenging yourself. Then you realize you write a song without cussing. Mm. And then you're like, hmm, I didn't cuss. And sometimes you don't even notice. Sometimes did. somebody else is going to tell you like, oh, I like this song. You didn't cuss in it. And you're like, oh yeah, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> but what I started doing is when I write a song, I'm very intentional. So I'm not writing it f for somebody who's going to listen. Mm -hmm. I'm writing it from my heart. So at that particular moment in time, I am just, it's just me and the paper. So I'm giving out my heart as it is. Mm -hmm. So whatever was in my heart, my mind is going to come good. out. So if it's cussing, I'm sorry, it's but it. it's going to come out undiluted. Okay. You stayed a lot with Lusai. Yeah. And like from the conversation, you have been mentioning him again and again. What, what role, apart from, let's say, discipling you? Okay, let's, let's get there. From discipling you and all these things um, that were happening in you and were changing, what role did his death play in the way you looked at life? Because what you have, uh, for me, what you have explained is um, you're trying to find out yourself and like from the the teaching that you were, you were studying at that point where yeah. you were like really questioning about, okay, do we do this just for other people, for ourselves or for God? Yeah. And I'm thinking it's in that space, it's in that period that you have all these things going on and then Lusai on his missionary journey he passes died. on. Yeah. How did that affect your life and how you looked at things and your perspective up to now? I think the truth is it broke me. Uh, the messed up thing is on that fateful day 
I didn't lose just Losai. I lost Wanangwa as well. Wanangwa. Because by the time that accident happened, I was living in Els and Wanangwa was actually just up the street. So he was a guy that I became very close to. So I didn't know him by moving to Els. I actually knew him in Blanta. So I knew him before already, but we got in close. And he he was at that level, that Lusayo level in my life mm-hmm. at that particular time. He's a guy that I would literally wake up in the morning and be at his house, like right in his living room and wait for him to wake up like, hey, dude, I'm here, yeah. <laughs> you know? So when they both died, on the actual day, man, I was crazy because that was the night of 5th December going into 6th. So it was the 6th in the morning. Mm. I blacked out, man. I, I don't even remember how I left my crib, but for some reason I was at the Basin Truth Studios where I found Keith making a beat. And Keith had heard the news okay. and he knew what these people were to me. Yeah. And what I remember is him saying, do you want the beat? And I was like, yeah. And on that day, I recorded a song for them. Mm. I didn't even write it, man. It, was, it just came from the heart. Like it was, I think the shortest studio session we've ever had. <laughs> Because I just went in there, rapped two verses straight. And after I did, I broke down. Because I think it hit. Yeah. When I actually finished recording, it hit. Like, all oh, those guys are gone. So it messed me up. But the aftermath, I think I did not expect it. Because I think it took a few months. That's when I started realizing I was very angry with God. I was very angry. And I was angry with God for like two years straight, if not three. It was crazy. It was a crazy time. Mm-hmm. And in that time, I made a lot of songs as well. The truth is that in that time when I was angry with God, I tried to appease myself, you know, and I would try and make what you call Christian rap. Yeah. But deep down, I was mad, you know. Then I realized, I'm not being honest. I went back to that teaching, you know, that thing we went through with Sayo. And I asked myself, what am I doing? Because I couldn't even identify myself. I didn't even know who I was at that point. Mm. So. I got to a place where I let it out. I went in the booth and I just let it out. And that's the reason why I never changed my name because I was like, no, nah, I'm being me. I'm being honest and I don't need to change my name. Yeah. Because now that takes me to what? <laughs> it was yeah, asking. like Because I know your name has been Sis Scripture from way back. I've yeah. listened to your music. In those days when you were with F611, I think you were on still, the... You, it's you, still F6 at heart. You're still yeah. F6 at heart. Because yeah. F6, yeah. F6 never died. It just transitioned. It transitioned. And a lot of people that were part of that transitioned, and which makes it very interesting. Um, okay. I used to in Costa Rica. Now, can you explain <laughs> that? Because I've listened okay. to, your, to your latest music. Uh, yeah. I've got your albums, like the, the latest ones that you released. It's different from what we know as know. gospel rap. Exactly. Um, first of all, to answer that, I do not know what is the meaning of gospel rap. Because... In my journey from the start, I just wanted to be honest with my music. As you know, Tupac was my greatest influence. And one thing that Tupac was, was honest. Tupac was Yeah. Yeah. He was very honest about where he stood. 
whatever point in time he just gave you his heart. So that inspired me a lot because it's not about wearing a face. You know, people wear a face, you know, what's politically acceptable. And they're going to say what is politically correct. But is that real? That was my question. Is that who I am? So I, I, I don't act. I can't act. So when I realized I'm not being honest with in my music, I stopped being dishonest in my music. So you stopped putting biblical perspectives. No, my or... music always has biblical perspective if you listen hard enough. Mm-hmm. What do I say in my music? Despite everything I'm going through, despite everything that I see, I'm still pointing you in one direction. I'm still telling you that God stands above all things. And I'm telling you that that's the direction we should all go. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to show you to say, it's not going to be a pretty journey. It's not going to be rosy like people paint it to be. Yeah. And it's not going to be always politically correct. Or you're not going to be that person you always think you're going to be. Sometimes you're going to feel pissed off and you're going to cuss people off. But what's going to make the difference from one time for you not to do it again is learning to actually see that this is not the right path. And sometimes you have to fall to learn. Do do you think a lot of Christian uh, rappers, I I know you've said that you don't know what the word Christian rapper is. But the conventional word is a person who, who has dedicated their music, their craft, to talk about Christ and to advance the message. I would put it in that way. Christ-centric. Christ-centric music. Okay, so I, I hit you with a question too. No, I, 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 the question was not there yet. Okay. So the question is, do you think uh, a lot of people don't want to do that, but they feel pressured to do that because of trying to be uh, politically correct as you have pointed it out? Okay, so having been there, here are some truths that people will never say out loud. Yes, I need that. Partly, people do it because they've never been given an audience. And here's an audience. This is what they want to hear. So might as well just rap what they want to hear. As long as I get that love, I'm cool doing it. So they're going to change their whole life. Now, the thing is, if you fake something for so long, you begin to believe it. Believe it, yeah. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't make it real. You get? So you're doing it for the crowd. You're living a certain way. You're saying certain things. Yeah, the crowd will hype you. They'll be like, oh, you're touching my life. People get emotional and all of that. But deep down, when you come back to that question I asked in the beginning, you realize you're doing it for selfish reasons. You're not being honest. You're doing it for you. You're doing it to get the hype. You're doing it to get the glory. You get So you're not doing it for God. You're just doing it simply because the crowd will accept. To identify so people can identify exactly. as the one that does. Exactly. So and to- the, other, the other thing is that, the ugly thing is that, when people started accepting Christian rap, quote unquote, mm-hmm. they created a market. Mm-hmm. And what every market does is supply and demand. So if people are demanding something, people go on the supply side. Okay. And that's the unfortunate thing to say a lot of artists today. You go back to, I was fortunate enough to walk with some of the artists that are like big names now, you know, and not rap with them, but walk with them in that journey. Mm. So the people who I can tell you, the authentic, like I get him. His, that's who he is. You get. And the people I can tell you today that I look at them and I'm like, I don't think you're being real, man. But since you're popping, it is what it is. Do you think? There was a time uh, during those days, right, where uh, the concepts were even similar. 
like during the Rusayo times, right? You yeah. Know, like, that time, like Christian hip hop was that was a thing. Mm. Like uh, people were just, and the concepts were just similar. Uh, you're apologizing about a scene you did in your thoughts. <laughs> Lord, I have seen that, whatever. It was that, it was that. And it was on all over colleges, it was all over radio, there were programs being made for it. Um, but it's crazy that things are dying now. Do you think Christian hip hop is dead in Malawi? Well, I, I, can't, I can't answer for the whole of Malawi, but I can tell you where most of those songs came from. Most of, so the thing is, like, for instance, even F611, I told you, it was never about the music. It was about the journey. The journey with the people. That so came. most of those things, most of people, would, they came from Bible studies. It came from you chill and you'd have deep conversations and people would feel convicted, you know, and they would make a song. That came from truth. So it wasn't making a song out of, you know, like when David did Psalms 51, mm -hmm. people started apologizing in music because it, it was cool. Because yeah. David did it. Yeah. yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. But I know for David, it came from the right place. You know, it came from deep down because he actually came to a realization to say, I screwed up. But because he went on record, he had to apologize on record. Which took a lot of guts. Mm. And if you remember, at that particular point in time, to apologize wasn't a cool thing the to do. It was a thing to do. <laughs> you know, but then after he did it, Everybody you had a lot of artists now coming, coming out in. now with that. With that. Yeah. So I wouldn't answer for everybody to say it's dead. The truth about it is, I think it's evolving. I don't think what people expect it to be is what it is, is what I can say. Because if you ask me, in the sense of the word, I'd name myself a Christian rapper. <laughs> what? I'm just being honest. I'm being honest because I take you back to the Bible, Samson. Samson was one guy in the Bible who God was with him. And mind you, if you check, that is the only, by, like, the only book in the Bible that repeatedly says, but God was with him. But, and it was always, but God was with him. Because he's the one guy who disobeyed everything God said, do not do. When God said, don't do this, he went and did it. I told him, don't be with the women from the other side. He was there. Don't touch a dead body. He went and ate honey from a lion's carcass. You know, that was that guy. And what stands out about his story for me is not, I'm not saying that you got to go and intentionally be disobedient, but it was a lesson to be authentic. He was who he was, but God was with him. Now, in the end, it was a tragic end. Because if he had obeyed, it wasn't going to be tragic. I hear you. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, David Galidan, uh, <laughs> say, I'm not a hip hop artist. Uh, didn't yell body. Do you think he was trying to run away from you people, uh, putting in quotes, <laughs> you people who are trying to be authentic? But you're still using the, uh, you're still being coined as Christian rappers. So you nah, want to I, think, I think, I think. He had started seeing the problem that I had started seeing. Mm. And I think for him, he was trying to, because for him, he says it's his ministry. I respect that. That's his ministry. So if you view it in that way and then you see people diluted, that would become a problem. And hip hop is kind of wide and very diverse. So, it did create a problem for him to say, I have this as a ministry, but then at the same time, you have another guy that's just going to come and say he's a Christian rapper. And it's just, you know, and you actually know this person is not authentic. And you are at threat 
with your ministry, with your truth that you want to come out with. Because once you're all associated as one, then people don't know what is true anymore. So I think it was a situation where he, this is just me speculating, but I think a situation where you, you'd be like, okay, I'm stepping out. Like, y'all guys do what you do, but what I'm doing is different. different from what you do you think David Gayani is a gatekeeper of the Christian hip-hop? I don't call him that. Hmm. Because I don't think anything like Christian hip-hop exists. But, but in that realm, right? In the Because him, of- it's a ministry. So mm-hmm. that's a whole different thing. At that point, it's not even hip-hop. It's mm-hmm. what he's doing. So whatever that he says. Whether whatever he, that he is. It in a beat that is hip-hop in nature. Yeah, because I, I think he doesn't rap to just hip-hop beats. I've heard him on dance with beats and stuff. So that's his journey, you know? But I don't think anybody should be a gatekeeper for anything of that sort. Because... Mind you, I'll take you back to my philosophy of being completely honest. If you're being completely honest, you're being who you are. You're saying who you are on the record. What are you gatekeeping? Because it's that exact mentality that brings about these divides. Because you feel like you're entitled to owning something. You represent an ideal. The moment you start saying, I represent a specific ideal, I own this ideal then you're no longer real. Then it's, it's no longer. So if you're talking about the message of God, why are you the one gatekeeping? God should be the gatekeeper of that truth. So if you ask me, I don't think anybody should be a gatekeeper. I think it's pretty weird what's happening right now. When I listen to what what is coming out right now, I'm just like, oh, thank God I'm not doing that. Because we all about the crowd now, man. It's yeah. funny enough, I'll tell you this. Do you know back in the day we never even marketed the music? Yeah. We never did. That's why I find it hard even to market myself as an artist right now. Because it came from a real place. We, we just, people knew you because, well, thank God they know you. But we never went out and marketed stuff. Like, when I did Before Grace, the EP, mm. there were CDs. There were CDs. You never saw me selling any CD. They were all given out for free. Mm. We actually spent, that time 20000 was a lot of money. We spent twenty grand, got like, I think it was 200 CDs, and we would just give them out. And you're not trying to get known. You're giving them out because you're spreading something. We believe that we're spreading a message and that's the medium, you know? So today it's a whole different landscape, you know? You see you see a whole business set up around it, a whole scheme around the whole thing, and you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's how it is. What do you think about Suffix? Oh, he's a great artist. Is he a great Christian artist? I uh, cannot answer about his Christianity. That's between him and God. He's a great artist, though. He is? As an artist, he's a great artist. Hip-hop, he's not an MC. Okay. He's a great artist. Yeah. He's not a great MC, mm. but he's a great artist. Artist is 360. Yeah. You get? Like 50 Cent. 50 Cent is a great artist. I don't think he's a great MC. MC down. I don't think 50 is going to stand in a battle like a rap battle and, and battle it out. Like, I'm not going to take Black Thought and 50 Cent. That's like, are you crazy? You get? Because Black Thought is like an MC, man. Like, legit, legit. Like, Jadakiss. <laughs> Those are MCs, you know? But 50 is like a well-rounded artist. So the way I look at Suffix, I look at him in that light. He's like a well-rounded artist. And I think... I think at some point there was some VN that came out because we were talking on some group and some people decided to take it out of context and people actually thought I was dissing him, but I wasn't dissing him. I was actually saying that particular point to say, as an artist, he's a great artist. He's by far, I think, in this generation, 
probably the best artist I have seen. Then you have Ajna Elin Juji, them, because I think they've taken his blueprint. Yeah. You know, but as an MC, I'm like, nah. You think his bars are weak? Not weak. His, his, <sighs> they're just okay. <laughs> they're just okay. It's, it, it's not, his bars are not bars that wow me. Uh. There are some bars that actually are annoying. When he says it, you're like, nah, you're not Lil Wayne, stop it. You know, because, well, I, I get it. Lil Wayne influenced the whole culture, mm. you know. But when people do it now and they do it in their way and you're like, no, nah, no, nah, dude, don't do that, <laughs> you know. But overall, his, his bar's okay. His bar's okay. Yeah. Who, who are your, this top five MCs in my life? Top five MCs. I was afraid you'd ask me that. <laughs> because we're talking about MCs. Man, I know. Like, I, oh, MCs. Yeah. MCs. Okay. Top five MCs. Yeah, I'm looking for someone there. Okay. Um, I had number one is difficult, man. Mm. Number one is difficult. But I'll put third eye there. Yeah. I'll put third eye in number one. Um, number two... This is difficult, man. I did not think it would be this tough. <laughs> uh, number two, I'll put Liu. Okay. Uh, not the new Liu. That, 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 that yeah, album, I didn't like that album. <laughs> I didn't like it. But the old one, right? I know Liu can spit, man. Yeah. You exactly. know, I felt like he mellowed himself down. Mm. Now, this is me talking as a fan. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, bro, give me that one, you know, that but, kind of thing. That one wasn't working for the for the mainstream. I guess that's why I'm not blowing up then, because I don't do it for the mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's why I'm not blowing up. But anyways, I feel like, yeah, on my number two, there's Leo. Uh, number three, let's see, number three. Uh, uh, GD, bro. GD. But I'm going to put them both as Marcus there, man. <laughs> Why? They're both taking three as one person. Okay. Because okay. yeah, they're a beast, bro. They're a beast. Yeah. Um, four. Put Marv. Marv? Yeah. Uh, okay. I put more. Okay. I put myself on number five because I'm confident. <laughs> <laughs> I put myself there. But I'm surprised. I'm, like, he's one of the dopest. MCs yeah. Ever. Okay. Because when you, when you listen to like music, if yeah. you are listening to hip hop, mm. like I listened to one song and I actually just hit you up like, dude, can I get your album? <laughs> I sent you the mail. I was like, I listened to that like yeah. from first song. I was like, okay, why is and. Why is it that you're not there? Why is it that... So I was like, he's okay, he's, he's not a mainstream artist. artist. He makes music so you can listen to it. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think... But you... you I, I think if I wanted to, to just put effort on it and sound like those guys, I would. I would sound like those guys. I know how to sound like those guys. <laughs> I, I mean, I do know how to sound like those guys. But... Most of the time, it's just something that doesn't sit with my conviction. So I just go on the music, be honest. And the other thing is that I'm a boom bap person. So I actually let the music speak. I don't let the beat dictate me. So that's the other thing that hip hop is losing now. Because if you remember, if you take it back to the 90s, it was just basic beat, you know, just... You've got the beat, the just the break beat, the bass, keys, maybe a little bit of synth in there, and then rap. It's just the you know, and sometimes the beat would not transition at all. Yeah. It would just be from the start to the yeah. finish, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. no transition. But people enjoyed that because they were listening to the artist. They weren't listening to the beat. As time went along, people started listening to the, the beat. beat. They don't listen to the artist. People say the weakest shit. My bad. 
But they say the weakest things. No, you, you, you could you could break it like that. Yeah, they say the weakest Can't things. Like legit. Yeah. Legit. <laughs> they say the weakest things and people are like bars. That's it not a bar, bad. man. Like, what is that? You know? Uh, and then, you know, Lil Wayne came up with this thing um, where I don't even know how to put it. Where he says the most obvious thing. And then people are like, bars. And you're like, back in my day, a bar was something that, yeah, it, it had you dig deep. You know, you'd listen... I still listen back to, like, even Third Eye. You listen back to Third Eye, and you're still getting some stuff today. And that song came out, like, ages ago. And you're like, oh, so I miss you that. Miss. You're like, oh, that completely flew over, you know? And you get through certain experiences, and you listen back, and you're like, ooh. But you've been listening to this song. Yeah. You've been listening to this song through and through. That's the same thing with like the rest of the people I put like on my top five. Why, why is Dave Tigaria not there? He's a legend. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. He, he, he's, he's good. He's probably like number six. Where is Suffix? You, you, you asked me about MCs. Oh, we're talking about MCs. Yeah. yeah. Artist. Okay. He's an uh, artist. That's, that's a whole different. It's going to look different. Gwamba is not an MC. He's also a very good artist. Mm. But he's not an MC. Okay. I'm yet to hear him on a track where it's not hype and it's just hip hop. Like, okay, it's time we kill people. Like, oh, when I say kill people, I mean in yeah. the literal hip hop sense. Like, let's kill bars. I'm yet to hear him on that. I mean, this is the reason why, going back to SA, this is the reason why I actually like um, Casper. Because Casper does that. He's like a very good transition between the fun guy and then he becomes the MC. And you're like, oh, okay, okay. okay. You know, when you hear, you, you actually see him switch lanes and he gets serious and you're like, okay, okay. The reason why I think I was in much of an AKA fan was because it was too much singing. And I was like, I liked the old AKA, like when he would rap, like he was like, oh, okay. And then he started the whole lot of singing. I was like, I don't want to hear that, man. He was like, bad at singing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there was like a lot of auto tune like, too. Was, was, yeah, he was just like putting in the auto tune thing in there, yeah. but his singing, I think, was great. Yeah, but he was more, he was a better MC than he was a singer. At, at, at first, yeah. Because, I remember, like, I think it was his first album. Yeah, he like, rapped a lot, man. There yeah. were crazy partners in there. I was like, Whoa. okay, so who's this guy? Like, I'd, actually, his first album, I'd put him up there with Proverb and them. Whoa. Because Proverb is a beast. He, that's how he game. came. Yeah, that's and how he introduced I, himself to the game. And I expected him to come with the fire. And then he switched. Yeah. And I was like, okay, you lost me. I was like, he lost me. And that was it. That's how he lost me. But Casper brought that transition, you know, where he was. You'd listen to one album, he's being mellow. Same album, he's being all playful and fun. And the same album, he's just coming serious as an MC. So I have Casper albums that I don't listen to certain songs, but I listen to a majority of songs. So that makes him cool to me. Okay. Great. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So you're not a on Monday artist. Have you ever dropped on an, an, an Made on Monday? I did. I tried, eh? Because <laughs> there was a time a couple of homies pressured me. They're like, you got to drop, man. Speak to Joy. Speak to Joy. And then I texted him. And then apparently they had already spoken to him. And then he heard my stuff and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I got a spot for you. And then he put my stuff and I went on the comment section. I was expecting some serious stuff and it was all playful. And I was like, I don't think I'm doing this again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was pressured into doing it again. I okay. did it again. And then I was like, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> and I haven't done it since. Because it was like, you put my joy. Yeah. And some people, um, it's, it's just playful. Yeah. So like sometimes, okay. So now imagine it. 
I'm the guy Oguji Umaji who got many a track. You sit down with the guys and they listen and then you'd get serious critique, man. Like people would actually tell you, I think you should have approached it in this way. I think that. And when you wrap it out, you would get that appreciation where people would actually get what you're saying. And then you get to the modern day where nobody's even listening to what you said. Yeah. It's like, I eat a book. People enjoy it. Hey, and I, 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 <laughs> but did you get the point though? Because it's like, do you get the point of the song? Because you'd expect maybe you drop a song, there are like 2,000 comments, you'd expect someone saying something like, oh, I actually relate to what it's saying. Or, oh man, I, I, I just have a whole different perspective after that drop. Nah, not, not on those comments. Nah, and it's not that. And for me, I think as an artist, it actually demotivated me because I was like, really, guys? I know some people live for that, but for me, it was like... Yeah, they get us and put them on their WhatsApp status. <laughs> like, for real? Like, Dennis, yeah. yeah. Like, for real? Yeah. You know, I was like, praise this, right? Like, yeah. People like, the, I thought you were those playing those with me. Like, you for real? Yeah, for real, for real. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, if people drop a song or they put out something and they screenshot those comments and then put them on their WhatsApp status, like, <laughs> this is the the mad love that I'm getting. And it's like, those <sighs> comments, like, really, just like, yeah. I, I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's not love, though. Yeah. That's not love. Because when you listen to an artist, it was you're digging deep into them. You know, you're like, you're trying to get what they say. That's that's the reason why I also consider Suffix and Guamba as great artists. Because you listen to what they say and they're not just being playful. They might sound playful, but they, they really do come with content. And you're like, okay, I did not see you package it like that. You know? And, this is stuff that won't just hit you emotionally. Like, you know, Guamba can bring in like a serious message and make it sound so playful, but it sticks to your head. So it does, it has that effect. It sticks to your head and you chill in there and you just vibe in your head and you're like, oh, you're thinking about it, you know? So that's, that's what I call great art because he's managed to bring to your attention something. But if it's going to be something like a one-hit wonder where it just pops and then we all forget about it, then I don't consider you a great artist. I just consider you like, yeah, you are hot at that time. People are going to hate you on this interview because... Yeah. Young, 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 K, uh, young, young K is also a beast, though. He's uh, a beast. He's a beast. But people will be like, no, no, no. Young K was supposed to be somewhere there. Uh, okay. I get it, I get it, but no beef with him. He's he's shown me nothing but love. And I also respect him. It's like he's he's a beast. Like he's not I wouldn't even start ranking him. He's not in the ranking group. You know, it's like when people tell you the top five dead or alive and you don't mention Tupac, yeah. but you're wearing his hat. <laughs> it's like Nah, man, we're not even going to start talking about Tupac because yeah. he's just the head of all of that. That's like Young K. Okay. Because, man, that guy, I, man, I, I can't even start to explain. But the reason why I didn't mention him is I, I don't even rank him because I don't think he should be ranked. He's done pretty much everything every artist would want to do. That's me thinking. And he's done it and he's outdone everyone in doing it. Even when he's not trying. Just goes like he's just, easy. he's just there chilling. And it's just a feature that he probably did just because. And you hear it and you're like, damn, what were you thinking? But that's him. So I don't rank him. He's probably in the leagues of. Okay. 
Cause Sigidi, 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 Sigidi did something that nobody could do. He's in that league over in JB. Yeah. Because JB did something that nobody ever could do. Nobody can replicate JB. Sigidi. Hey. That guy was. Bro, like, even his style. That's like Malawian Buster Rhymes. Nobody can replicate that. Nobody. So these are artists that are in their own league. Like, you don't even rank these guys. You don't even start to. You don't even put them in the conversation of ranking because they are just outdoing everything that can be done. Because when Sigidi dropped, man, like, everyone was like, hey, what? Different. You know, like, Sigidi was playing everywhere. Mm. everywhere you know that's like jb man when jb dropped everyone was like even the ghetto mm. like the most ghetto place in the ghetto was bumping jb yeah. you get so th- those are people that you don't rank it's like trying to rank 50 in 03 like as you know it's dirty like you don't rank those guys they're those guys who, when you look at their art, they, when you look at their art, they've outdone themselves. They've outdone the culture. They just came with a whole different artistry and it impacted the game. And the impact they've had on the game, you, you can't measure it. Oh. Which artist can you point to me who hasn't been influenced by Young K in Malawi? Who, I think there was a time that they are probably his peers, but yeah. everybody after that, you, know, you look up to him. And starting say, from the dressing, the style, just if it, just being chilled, people have been influenced. Now you 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 don't rank such people because those are just forces. Like JB, you know, he came, he inspired the modern ghetto rap, yeah. man. Like, <laughs> everything that you hear in the ghetto now, probably that's JB. <laughs> you know, so those are people who even today can't go wrong. Even if they dropped a whack track, man, we're going to still we'll bump like, it. We're going to be like, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> yeah. of the impact, you know? Um. D was that person to me at some point. Yeah. And what happened? I don't call it beef. Mm. Uh, he what said things he wasn't supposed to say, and I responded. Which was, which song was that? Uh, it was on QR's album. Mm. I think called it Prayer. Mm. It was also on his album. I don't know what he called it on his album. But it was a personal conversation that me and him had had. Oh. And something that I would have expected him to respect. Whoa. He, David is witty. You know, he says, he says things in clever ways. Like, David is an artist that I feel a lot of people will never get. Mm. He's that artist who says stuff and you won't figure it out until five years from now. Like, oh, that's what he was saying. But having spent time with him, mm-hmm. I kind of got him. So okay. when he said certain things, mm-hmm. it was disrespectful. What, what was the line like? It wasn't one line. It was a series of lines. Oh. So where he started with the line mm. to where he ended... I think where he ended was, I make you see scripture. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> when I get on the mic, I make you see scriptures. I know, no, 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 no. You so just talked like about you. my struggles. You just talked about my family. Now you're going to say you made me? Nah, bro. I know he didn't mean it in that context, mm. but that's the context he brought it. So naturally, people don't want to respond to David. Mm. Because I don't know if they're afraid or whatever. Me, on the other hand, I've got a problem. I'm not scared. 
So I say what I have to say when I have to say it. So when I heard it, I was like, okay. I went in the booth. It was a night. I recorded two songs, sent them to my people. My people told me, this one is never coming out. It's not seeing the light of day. This is bad. This, you're not. No, no. I, I was crazy. Like, I crazy. And I was like, okay, it's not coming out. So I'm taking out the other one. So I waited for his birthday. I dropped it on his birthday. Posted it everywhere. Wrote him the <laughs> lyrics. And then he called me. What song was that? The Ugly Truth. The Ugly Truth. What was the line that was... The Ugly Truth, that was my song. Yeah, but the, the line that you had, maybe it was more it was more heating to him. I think for me, the thing that was more disrespectful was him talking about a personal struggle and making a clever bar out of it. I mean, if I have talked to you about, oh, bro, I'm struggling with this. This is what I've been going through. I had to go through A, B, C, D. And you and my mans at that time walking with me in that journey. And then years later, you decide to make a clever bar out of it. For me, that's disrespectful. Because it's like, what? Mm -hmm. You're going to say my personal stuff just to look cool? Mm -hmm. You get what I mean? Like, you don't. Struggling to you, can't, you, you, you don't do that. You know, if I told you in confidence, you didn't ask me if I want to talk about it. You never hit me up to say, oh, dude, I'm dropping this. What you think? Because if he had hit me up, I would have told him, man, you change those bars, man. Change those bars. And probably never would have escalated to what it was. Because, he, yeah, he called me after, after I dropped Ugly Truth. He called me up. He apologized. But the damage is already done. And I told him, sorry, bro, but I recorded two tracks. So if one track ever happens to surface, I'm, I'm, glad to <laughs> I'm just letting you know, I did two tracks. And the other one is really bad. <laughs> I told him, the other one is really bad. He said, send it to me. And I was like, Because I had to ask the team, like, so guy says I should send him the track. They're like, no, <laughs> no, you're not doing that. Mm. And I never sent it to him. And then he tried to make amends out of it in a very weird and very messed up way. Because afterwards he told me I'm coming to L's. We want to shoot a video. And it's going to be a video for, I think it was the same song if it wasn't another song. But I felt that was going to be disrespectful because I was like, "What, I, bruh, I just dissed you and you want me in a video for the same song you're disrespecting me. <laughs> what the hell? Uh, I'm like, how do you process stuff? <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I didn't get it. So it made me question whether his apology was authentic. Mm -hmm. But I decided to leave it at that. I decided to leave it at that, and I just left it to say, you know what? If you ever do take a shot at me, there's another song. I'll be there. There's another song waiting. No, I'll probably record another one, but I'm just saying I'll be there. I'll be there because I don't take disrespect lightly. Mm. You know, especially for a person who I gave you my trust. That's violating my trust. Mm. I gave you my trust and loyalty. Mm. And then you decide to play with it just to be cool? Nah, bro. I'm not gonna. That's, that's the utmost disrespect. <laughs> okay. Over to Dennis. I think I just, most of the game, because I, I knew a few things around those beef days. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. beef per se. It was just, it, it was, he, he disrespected me on a record. And I just responded to tell him how I felt on a record. Because he didn't, he didn't bother to call me before he did the record. So I just decided, oh, since we're talking to each other through music, I'm just going to yeah, talk back to right. you exactly how I feel. So I said, this is how I feel. And the ugly truth is that 
you kind of being this. And I think, yeah, because he told me it hurt him. So. Okay. Okay. But I got nothing but love for him. Yeah. But I'm just saying, if he does disrespect me again, I'll be there. (laughs) (laughs) You're not like, uh, you're not like the guy who says, uh, I I kill rappers. Like, uh, if someone comes to me, if I drop one, it's like he's dead. He's dead, like, what? Okay, cool. So, uh, I think for, for the for the sake of time, the, the, there's one thing that I want to understand, like from you. Yeah. Um, I know on your journey, mainly with um, six. What do you call this? Six. What F six? F six. F six. Yeah. F six. I love it. You interacted a lot with uh, gospel, and um, through the same those uh, this whole tour that happened, and those jihazia, where you part of. Yeah, yeah. You're part of it. my name was on the fly. Yeah, I think that was that was the first show where my name was not in the group of many more. <laughs> but it was like there with it was like preacher. right there, and I was like, has a yeah. Gospel. I was like, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. What, what 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 was your experience working with uh, those guys? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say I worked with them, but it was a very good experience. I mean, preparing for shows everything just watching the creative process um i was blessed just to just roll with geo man because one thing that people don't know is geo is a beast bro he is geo is a beast his he creative is. process everything mm. geo is like the one he's in that group where you don't rank this guy because <laughs> He's going to be playful. He's going to come up with a beat that's playful and he's going to come up with serious message. It's just going to hit your heart. Like just slice it in half and just put the message in, you know? Yeah. So I was, he's one of the artists that has also had a very big influence on how I approach my art on just being playful and also just being able to do it while you're actually giving something. But the challenge is that when you do that, Mm. it flies over a lot of people's heads. Like I, I challenge people. I say, I feel like most of the people that listen to my music haven't actually heard what I'm actually saying. saying. Because like, for instance, recently that, that this is pretty much the last thing I put out the sixth element. Yes. I feel like it just went over people's heads. (laughs) it just flew over starting from the concept it just flew over like I was like I think I'd have to do a video to like explain this whole thing because the whole project was just to just crunch it down a bit like the whole project was centered on you know what the sixth element is right is this on the periodic table yes (laughs) what is the sixth element Carbon. Carbon, yeah. Exactly. So the sixth element, and we're carbon-based life forms. Mm. So carbon takes different forms, but it's still carbon. It's still carbon, yeah. But it takes different forms. You put it under so much pressure, it becomes a diamond. Mm. Same carbon forms up big percentage of my skin, my pretty my humanity same thing if i'm not mistaken lead is pretty much yes, carbon well, yeah. so you have all of these forms that carbon takes and what i was trying to say with the sixth element is just that that we're just humans in different, different forms, forms. Yeah. we we manifest in different forms when different pressures are applied to us so when you apply a different pressure, I'm going to be a diamond. If you don't apply enough pressure, I'm just going to be crude oil or something else. But even if I become crude oil, crude oil is still valuable. A diamond is still valuable. Yeah. Human skin, that's still valuable. The carbon in the atmosphere is still valuable. So we're valuable in different senses. Even in the ugliest form, we still 
hold value. And that's how God sees us. Okay, so working with these guys and Jehazel, to be specific. Jehazel, I, I haven't worked with him in the lab, but we've had a lot of conversations. Conversation. Yeah, okay. So for, for me, like working is basically conversations because from your explanation, like you with, let's say from the conversation with the uh, Sayo and yeah. all the guys, it was more like, more than music it was like yeah. music was more like an extra thing that was kind yeah it of just it just the, it just fell in there it was it just fell in there unfortunately that's what people saw people saw the music the music yeah but really it was just the brotherhood but but Jehazo, uh left the, the game he did yeah he the left game. the faith he left the faith <laughs> the <game. laughs> actually that's my question he left the so faith. Wait, wait, when when you heard that from when you were with him his um his faith that he shared with you as brothers during that period and when he left, how did that affect you? How did you look into everything and also maybe just the perspective of life? And no, I, 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 respected, I respected him and his decision because I feel like we all experience God in different ways. We all experience God in different forms. You remember what the Bible says about Pharaoh, you know? you know, God sends Moses, let my people go. But there's a specific statement in that whole story that stands out for me. He says, I created you for a time such as this. Just, that was the whole point of his creation, to be hard-hearted. So, at that particular time. At that particular time. So I believe that nobody is a master of anybody's journey because every journey is personal. So whatever God is doing in someone's life might not be the exact same thing that he's doing in another person's life. So he might renounce the faith, but that might just be God's way of reaching out to him in a different light. And you don't know for what his existence was made. So I cannot go against anything he says or that's, where he stands, I respect it, and I trust God for him. So I trust that whatever God is doing in his experiences, in his life, God is doing it for his glory. So I respect that. All right. Cool. Oh, so we've talked about a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many philosophers and stuff that you're talking about. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, is this the, the things that he really understands or the things that he's like just getting from chat GPT? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, this podcast coming, face. so I need to like get this so I can Can't keep this. a straight face. Then I have to have it in my head, eh? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting to hear if AI can just get in our heads because that would make life easier, man. <laughs> but no, 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 it's not chat GPT. That's me. That's all me. Um, speaking of AI, I mean, mm. the world is morphing. Um, unfortunately, I feel like as a country, we aren't as focused on where the world is morphing to because I think if you ask me, it all started with when people started legalizing marijuana. Mm-hmm. I feel like we should have just took it and ran with it. Because look at what that would have done to our economy. Yeah. It's just crazy, man. Like, yeah. I, I still don't understand why people why don't understand. There, like- I don't understand why we're broke. Because, I mean, I hear we grow the best weed. And today... Why can't we sell it? Have you seen the Chileka one? The Chileka yeah, one? they're burnt. Like, and I'm like, why are you burning it? Sell it. They've, they've just burnt weed? Yeah. yeah A lot of it. A lot of it. Wow. Yeah, but this, this is the thing. So you look at coding. Mm. Kids in China are learning coding in primary school. Yeah. Pretty much that same primary school that we went to, people are learning how to code now so they can make apps. Yeah. They can make all sorts of fancy For technologies. And now you've got these chat GPT AI things that are making it even simpler to do those things. Do that, yeah. And 
we're just focused on the wrong things. We're how, just, how, how much we're, how, we're really focused on the wrong things because how even much have you been personally using ChatGPT like since it came out like since it how, came how, out how useful has it been to you? It's been very useful for me because you know sometimes you don't know how to respond to an email <laughs> and like I'm just you're reading it and you're like Bruh. I don't know how to respond. Like, yeah. How do I say this in a professional, professional way? way that it should. <laughs> Deliver the message Chad that GPT I did. does it for me. It <laughs> does it for me. It does it for me. And it's been very helpful because for me, I, I take a lot of time to understand things, try and learn mm. a lot of things. So in my quest for learning things, it's been a very useful tool because sometimes you don't even know where to start searching online and you just go on there. Can you give me the evidence of A, B, C, D? And then there's all of this stuff and you're like, some of those things, you, you start spiraling down because mostly I just go copy everything, put it on another document. I'm like, and okay, let me start with this <laughs> and then let me go to that. And you're like, oh, 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 I did not know that. Yeah. You know, so... I think it's through chat GPT I knew about, apparently, is it in 2021, if not 2020, we launched a Hubble Space Telescope. Oh, yeah. Craziest yeah. thing, man. Like, it had me spiraling down into all of that, you know? Just trying to understand how this telescope works. Wait, uh, and then I was blown away to see what it discovered. But it's because chat GPT said... Together well, you might want to check that. And I was like, oh, oh. And I had to go like, I even went and watched all these documentaries and stuff. And I was like, man, we're doing amazing things in this world. Mm. So it makes you appreciate things like what um, Doug Suleiman said. Space. You know, like the space, space innovation and everything. Yeah, and people feel like, Oh, you're wasting money. And I'm like, nah, bro, he, he he's seeing something. Yeah. Like that, that's that's really something we should actually be talking about. Mm. And you you get to realize that there are a lot of things that we should actually be talking about. Then that we, we do not we, yeah, that we, sometimes right I, now we're just spending time with a lot of nonsense. We're not moving. I don't know if people act or they want to mislead other people. Like, okay, when I go on Facebook, I see the type of thing that people post there. Of course, yeah. it's Facebook, but sometimes you look at the people that are posting and you say, okay, so this person spent all his time <laughs> to write this. this or to comment on this in this manner. Yeah. There are a lot of young people that are there are actually like looking up to these people because of their positions or what they know about them. Why don't we like pivot that energy into important like things I'll, like this? I personally love if somebody brought up a conversation about our education policy, mm. because my question is, are we responding to the needs of today? Mm. I mean, we go to school and we're still learning grasshopper and stuff. And I'm like, where's that going to take me in the world? Because today, kids are coding. I have no idea how to build a circuit board. I have no idea how to code. I have to learn that in college when my brain is already developed. Yeah. You know, it's, we're talking about economics. You know, having, there's a part of the family that's in the US and there was a story they shared to say, oh, your little cousins went to school and they had this day where the parents have to give the kids money. They have to buy stuff. The kids have to buy stuff mm -hmm. and they have to sell them at school. When they sell this stuff, they have to come back with a profit. a profit. But do you see what they're teaching the kids? Yeah. They're teaching them business. Business, that's like true They're teaching business. them economics. They're, mm. they're teaching them everybody else got to go out. If you have like $5, you have $10, you have to come back with $15 or at least $20. Yeah. And I'm like, why are we not teaching? Our because kids. if you look at our generation, they never taught us how to use money. Mm. They never did. Mm. So we had to figure it out on our own. And you wonder why our economy is messed up? 
because we don't know how to use money. Actually, we I don't. Do, we don't invest. I don't know how many people like our age that were taught where money really comes from, apart from salary, and we didn't even know how much our parents were making. Like yeah. you don't mention your salary. That's so I feel these are all things that we ought to change. I mean, if I look at all these influential people, I'm like, why are we not starting conversations like those? Because at least we're gonna debate about it. We might not all agree, mm. but at the end of the day, at least there will be effort to actually make a difference because people actually say, I think we need to be doing that other than just leaving things the way they are because people say they review a syllabus and they take so many years to review it and by the time they're putting it, it's it's like already outdated. It's like the world is, I mean, we're living in a world where people have chat GPT. Where you can so, actually absolutely get everything that you need. Exactly. Like there, so you know? how do we you know, incorporate these technologies into our society? Education system. And then, because business. education, I believe education should be there to respond to the people's needs. Mm. So as the times change, our education should change. Because what our society is telling us our problems at that particular point in time should be addressed by what we're teaching our children. Absolutely. Because those kids, when they grow up, they will be addressing all of those problems. Yeah. So if we have a problem with our economy right now, why are we not teaching economics starting from primary, from school? primary school? Because you need to have people to understand the problems from the root to say, okay, don't make the mistakes that we've made. By the time you're coming here, you understand how the whole system works. works yeah. So if we're talking about these health, public health issues, why are we not having public health subjects in our primary schools, in our secondary schools? Because people need to understand. Because I remember when I was in school, we used to be told that there was a time in Malawi where Malawi was the cleanest country in the world. Mm. Why are we failing to get back to that? Now we have cholera. I mean... And it's like really bad. So, it's not just like, yeah, there, so like those are things that you, you get to look at and you're like, okay, as much as people want to always blame the leaders, but what are we doing about it? Yeah. Like put the leaders aside. What are we doing? We. Even our conversations are not reflecting that we want to make a difference. So how can we make a difference? Because the leader is just one facet. It's just up there. But we in our everyday lives, if we have that progressive mind to say, okay, no, that's not right. For instance, I think countries like Holland are the ones that started having the conversation of legalizing marijuana. Mm. It's because they sat down and they're like, okay, let's actually scientifically check all of these misconceptions. They checked them and they said 90% of it is crap. They're like, let's make what money. What are you doing? You know, they legalized it and people will fly from America to Holland to smoke to weed. smoke weed. And then, you know, <laughs> and we have the informal history that we grow the best weed on the planet. Mm. And we're saying, it's illegal. We're just going to do medical. Guys. Crazy. Wow. Like, what do you think about <laughs> chat GBT uh, stealing people's jobs? Copywriters. Well, as technology will, will advance, people will have to advance in themselves. The problem is that people are lazy. People don't want to advance. People don't want, we want to stick to the natural skill sets. Yes, yes. How we, so once we stick to the natural skill sets, when new technologies come in and take up those skill sets, you are going, you're going to be obsolete. But if we evolve and we see, okay, well, this can be done by that. So what, how can I be more useful? What, what skill can I learn? What can I do to elevate? Then you realize that people will find opportunities to doing other things. Mm. Because, I mean, code and all of these things, robotics, they can do so much. But there are certain things that humans will always have, have to, to do. do. So what are we doing about that? Because, yeah, a computer will now think it will be able to sequence actions but only in a limited capacity but a human will be able to make that judgment call so it should be how are we going to elevate our people because it goes back to the same thing why i talked about the education policy 
Because we're going to keep teaching our people to be something that is going to be replaced by AI. Mm. Now, everybody's going to be jobless. Yeah. Why are we not teaching them something <laughs> that, that will complement be- AI? Yeah. You know, because that is how we should be thinking. To say, okay, AI is coming. We should actually see it coming. It's there. It's coming. All right, guys, we need to switch up. In fact, I was thinking now, it could have been a cold break kind of situation, even in within the education system. Now, people just start saying, guys, let's do an overhaul right away because yeah. things are going to change right now. Things are going to change and it's not even in five years. It's actually no, it's so in the next two years, no. in, actually in the next six months, six months, it's going to be a How crazy world. But it's... Trying to use the open AI to like create their own things. Mm. How like chat GPT is just like one I don't of need, them. I don't need to to know how to code. You can In fact, just there are so many AIs, even music right now. Yeah. Do you know that you can actually mix? There's some website that does your mixing and mastering using AI. Mm-hmm. I, I decided to give it a go. It's, it's expensive, but, but like, okay. I did. I was like, damn. Soon I'm not gonna need an engineer. You like get what gonna, I mean? You're gonna be giving it voice prompts. Can you do this? Do this, this? You just input so it's giving you. If it's mixing, outputs. soon AI is gonna make the music too. Yeah, if there yeah. are some AI music. Yeah, music. like yeah. some are just gonna just make you the beat. You just record, and some you just write your lyrics and, and it will gonna record. It <laughs> it's gonna do everything. <laughs> Uh, uh, oh, Chad GPG is going to write it. Yeah. <laughs> Give it your feelings. And Chad GPG is going to write and it's going to make the ah, song. So shit. I think all of this goes down to that, to say, I think we have to find a way to complement the, the technologies that are coming up. If you're going to keep slipping, then Malawi is going to go further back. Yeah. But if we're going to elevate Malawi, we should start thinking in that way to say, what are the technologies that are there? Because I think the excuse that our parents always used to give us was Sizinafige. Mm. Uh, and all of that. See how the iPhone came to Malawi. Just a few years ago, you would have an iPhone, but you wouldn't use iTunes. Now everybody's streaming. streaming. It's actually easier to just have all your music online than just, you know, it's it's like difficult to just have all your music like you're just gonna send people on WhatsApp. Like I don't keep music in my phone. So people will text me and be like, Oh, I want your, I want song. your song and I'm like sending them a link because I don't have the song. Yeah. Because it's gonna eat up my space. space. Why should I have so why should I have space and I wanna listen space. to random songs at random times, you know? Yeah. So it makes much more sense for me to actually pay three or four dollars for a streaming platform platform, and listen at whatever time I want to listen, than keep ten thousand songs in my phone. That you would only listen to like two or three a week. So we we should be asking ourselves about that to say how are we going to elevate? How are we going to complement? How are we going to move from Okay, this is what the world is. We sh- actually right now we should accept the fact that these things will hit us quicker than they used to. Okay, cool. No, I think with that AI chat, <laughs> that's how we should conclude this. Um, Make me an AI. <laughs> but, but before you go, before you go, yeah, before man. we ask AI to, like, hey AI, can you please <laughs> drop some buzz? That this scripture <laughs> dropped like two years ago. Yeah, bro, we're gonna drop them now because next time we're just gonna tell AI. So this is how we're gonna conclude this podcast okay. with you dropping some buzz. Oh. Yes. Nah. Yes. Can I see? Yes. Some yes. Buzz. Yes. So song, some buzz, please. Ah, listen. <laughs> nah, no, I'm, not, I'm probably, probably not gonna, gonna remember. Drop buzz that we haven't heard before, which could be cool. All right. 
Let me take you back to days it was always rapping. Back to school halls where bars gave the fam reaction. And MCing was the reason we were skipping classes. Lend the rhetoric, it's literally been the fashion. And times has changed, niggas' names is getting fame. I'm funny rhyming and niggas capping to call it lame. It's fun of money and honeys that cool, y'all corrode the game. Talking gang gang when niggas never gang bang. They say the chain hang but mommy trying to pay rent. We on the same thing, surviving is the main thing. Trying to maintain when niggas never made pay. We in the third world where money is a dream girl you kind of blessed if you're rhyming and you're educated it's kind of funny that this rap is never demonstrated okay. that's fun that it's never demonstrated <laughs> <laughs> no uh michael this is scripture yeah man. bro it's been a pleasure sitting down with you and having this conversation and um yeah thank you so much for taking some time to come at a very short notice but and you, you sure you can, yeah <laughs> Have the speakers heating, right? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's been, it's been a minute since I've actually been on stage, yeah, yeah. it's been a minute since I've actually because right now I'm working on a project, okay. Um, so when you're in that writing space, it's you kind of block out all those yeah, energies because yeah, when you get out of album mode. You're, you're now memorizing everything, keeping it in your head. Yeah. But when you're writing, you're, you're, all, you're constantly you creating. You're like, okay, now nah, that's not a better take. Maybe I should style it like this. Maybe I should go like that. Yeah. So you're constantly, because even before, uh, before coming through, yeah. I was actually writing something. And I was like, okay. So, yeah, it, it kind of happens a lot. Like, even when I'm writing, I don't listen to other artists. I only listen to beats and other genres. Okay. Not hip hop. I see. I know I said Nas is my favorite MC, yes. but my number one is Black Thought. Okay. Number one MC, Black Thought. Then Nas. After Nas, Inspector Deck. Method Man. Number five is difficult, man, because they're really good MCs. <laughs> but number five. Give it a Sean Price. Oh. The late. It's, it's, it's crazy how, what or who most of people go for are not even on that list. Because people would talk about MC, people would be talking about Jack Hall, Kendrick Lamar, at risk. Because like, I'm sure they never heard Black Thought. <laughs> or they just don't understand it. Understand him. what? Yeah. Because Black Thought is a beast, bro. And Casper went levels when he made a song with him. Like, my respect for him, I was like, oh, you are that brave? Okay. Uh, I respect you. So, yeah, in Africa, probably put Casper Nazir up there. Because, hmm. man, he did a song with Black Thought and he stood his ground. All right. Like, okay, I respect that. I know people are saying, like, am I and all of that. I hear yeah. them and I'm like, I never heard them on a track with, like, Black Thought, <laughs> you know, mm. yeah, but I think MI did a track with Nas. Was that MI or was that who's that? MI, you, you are deep in that area, say, yeah, but one of them did a song yeah, with Nas. Nas. This That's one of them, these Nigerian guys, yeah, he did a song. I also got respect for that guy because he stood his ground. I was like, okay, you good. If it's Nigeria, then it has right. to be MI. I it think it was MI, MI. Yeah, it has to be MI, MI. Me yeah, so yeah, respect that. Yeah, because, man, you're going to get in the booth with Nas. Man, I, I'm, I'm going to be rethinking every bar. I'm like, nah, I'll, probably be t I'll be like, you know what? This is what we're going to do. I'm going to record and I'm going to give it to you. And you can record at your time. I'm not going to be there. And I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to listen when the song is mixed and everything. And when I hear it and it killed me, that's not coming out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah actually, featured Nas. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was him. Oh, yeah, yeah he oh, stood okay. his ground, though. Yeah. Stood his ground, so I was like, you good? You good? Yeah, true. Perfect. If you are to be given a chance to, to do with uh, Casper. To do a track be, with yeah, him? Yeah. I'd do it. Okay. I'd do it. He'll right. probably kill me, but I'd do it still. <laughs> I don't think he'd kill you. I, I think you would do pretty Casper well. plays too much, but he's a beast, bruh. Yeah. He's a beast. And he got those Malawian roots. Yeah. <laughs> So, 
Don't downplay him. Yeah. He's got those roots, so yeah, he can just dig deep from his ancestors and mm. you know, kill me. Uh, but, but you're here. You, you're, you're I'll here. try. I'll try, yeah. but yeah, he'll probably kill me because <laughs> it's good. Because yeah. once he makes that switch up and starts getting everybody all vibey, mm. I'd know that is my end. I'd be like, uh, yeah. okay, you win. But if he has if he let me do a track with him, mm. definitely taking that opportunity. Yeah. And what 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 does it, what does it take to to do a track with someone? Uh, do you, do you, do people pay for a feature? It just depends with how I feel. Uh, Mostly they don't. But if they don't, that means they're really good. Okay. I would probably charge you if you're whack. <laughs> I'd be like. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not going to waste my time. At least I should get paid for it. Yeah. But more, I don't charge. Because for me, it's more of... For me, the motto is art comes first. So the money, everything, I feel like it actually kills the craft. But because if you remember back in the day, it was just about collaborating. You sit together, you put their artistry there, your artistry, and you bring out this wonderful piece of art. But now all of that comes in the way because now people will tell you, I'm being managed by managers. And then another one will tell you, oh, you know what? You got to pay me like a hundred grand. And you're like, I get you got to survive, but maybe because I don't do rap to survive. But for me, art comes first. So I reach out. I mean, I've got an interesting story. So this random me throwing my music to random people it ended up reaching Buster. Buster Rhymes. Buster Rhymes. So he's like, I'll give you a verse what? for like, it was like, I think he said $2,500. <laughs> and what? I was making life decisions because <laughs> I really wanted it. Then I came to the realization that, no, I do not have this money. So I, I I left it and all I did was mention it in a song that we had a conversation and that's where it ended. But we had a a lovely conversation and he, he said something that really stuck to me because he said, yeah. if you love the craft so much, you have to invest in it. Yeah. And I understood where he was coming from, but I couldn't explain to him to say, I, mean, I kind of yeah, do yeah, it on the side, it. bro. Like... <laughs> I got a whole life, <laughs> you know? So maybe if I do make enough money that I have $2,500 to spend, yeah. I'm going to be like, I'm taking you up on that offer. <laughs> wow. Uh, that would be crazy. Come on. See scriptures. <laughs> man, right. like, he's one, of, he's one of the greats, man. Yeah. He's one of the great. That, that would change everything. So it was, it was, it was, it was a very, it was a very interesting, it was a very interesting situation, because I had to like, I was sending my family screenshots, like, okay. was, talking to Buster, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and my family was like, for real, for real, ask him this, and I was like, okay. Oh, he responded, <laughs> you know, wow. but it was, it was, it was, it was a real, it was a real opportunity and i figured out he's very humble mm. and he gives props where it's due because he actually heard the third letter oh, so okay. that's when we actually spoke because it was like oh one of my guys sent me this yeah. are you down and i was like hey wow i was like what Whoa. i was wow. like they ask you my family like who has well, 2,500? <laughs> and they were looking at me crazy, like, you want to do that for music? I was like, well, wow. it's Buster. Uh, yeah, uh, but... We, we should do a fundraising. Come like, on. Like, like, see scripture failed to do uh, a song with, with Buster. Because... 2.5. No, but even... That's, that's I reached out, I reached out to... Um, Bizarre. I reached out to Bizarre as well. Uh, Bizarre was actually like, give me $500 and I just didn't have it. <laughs> I was like, dude, I got to pay rent. I'm not going to give you $500 and not pay rent. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it was... We need, we need this no, but uh, honestly, like, <laughs> if... You know, because even MOP, like, I, I, I emailed them and I just... 
I was just throwing my shot there. I just, I just recorded a track, sent them, and then they emailed back like two weeks later and they're like, oh, we like your style, but this is our charges and everything. I was like, I never responded. <laughs> but the fact that they responded gave you me encouragement. Say, yeah. It gave me encouragement because it was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. I think they liked it. You got to a point that people would would know that they wouldn't waste their energy to drop a, a verse on your song. Oh well, God bless. Let's yeah. hope these people listen more and that get paid, man. Cause I need I need those features, man. I need yeah. those features. That, that feature be, be crazy. Oh, that feature will Trust me, I land that feature. That's my last album. <laughs> that's that's it. That's it. I will listen to that back and forth. I'll you be like, know. I'm done. You never know. You're gonna find yourself uh, talking to DJ Khan. You're gonna find yourself. He has organized the whole gang for you. <laughs> Nah, man. But no, that was that was an interesting moment, though. Absolutely. There was a very interesting moment. Jada also had a conversation with Jada, Jada, but I left that conversation because of the same money thing. So all the conversations I've had with like random multiple people, mm. it's always been a money situation no, where is. they, yeah, yeah for them the it's thing. a business. Mm. I respect that. Um, um, I don't know if you know Thayo Dasar. He's actually the guy that produced for exhibit. And he actually, he's the one who made the My Buddy beat for yeah. G-Unit. Wow. Chilled with him, like, he's a very humble guy. Chilled with him and he gave me a lot of advice. Cool. So he told me, oh, this is how those guys would approach. Mm. He'd tell me how they approach their music. So he gave me a lot of game, which for me was far much better than getting a beat. Because he gave me the game. Like, he told me how to approach. He told me how to actually approach my recording and everything. And I think that's what makes me different. Because when you start having these conversations with these people that are established and they're giving you game, when you come back, you're, like, leagues ahead. Because you don't have to walk where they already walked. Because they've already told you what they've discovered. So, but I heard the song, shout out, man. He's a great guy. Like, constantly chill with him. To a point, I think we, now it's just like, how's your family doing? How's my family doing and stuff? Like, but he's a cool dude. Okay. Exhibits producer. Like, I stopped, like, I got tired of screenshotting our chats. Because I just, I I realized, I think he's my homie now. (laughs) Because, you know, every time he'll respond, you're like, oh, I got to keep that. Got to keep that. And I was like, man, I hit him up and he hit me back. I'm like, oh, okay, now nah, I ain't got a screenshot. This it's right there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I did. On my album, South of Heaven. Um, Yeah. Yeah, he's my brother, man. Like, I look at him as an older brother, you know. Um, he's cool people. He's cool people. I've never had a problem with him, personally. So, I look at him with that respect, like an older brother. Like, like how you would do when you meet a, your older brother. You're like, yeah. I think I don't check up on him as often as I should, but, yeah. All right, so this is how we conclude our candid conversation with Mr. Michael Siscript Chipanya. And for everybody who loves podcasts, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you share this amazing conversation with your friends. Share, comment. If you have anything that you want to understand or find out from like my page. Uh, him, please, please drop it. He's going to be checking out your comments and yeah, probably will be like picking up some of the things that we didn't ask, but you might have uh, questions for and a big shout out to all the community podcast community watch i've been getting a lot of names for people and a lot of feedback and we're here because of your support so until the next one drops next tuesday keep it podcast malawi and you bro peace thank you so much and do like my page on facebook like his page <laughs> so you can get all the yeah, new music updates on the drops. new music. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, from us to you, peace. Peace.